It's Sarah Culpa. She's a restoration ecologist and botanist with the Fish and Wildlife Service here in the Nevada Fish and Wildlife Office. And uh, she's in Reno. She'll be talking about applying national seed strategy concepts. Good morning, everyone. So I know it's lunchtime, but I'm sorry you're going to have to listen to me and then one more person before you can eat. Um, as Jean said, um, I'm going to talk to you about our chapter in the Science Framework Part 2, which is applying national seed strategy concepts. And um, myself and my other two co-authors, co Fred Edwards with the Bureau of Land Management, Francis Kilkenny with the USA Forest Service, were the authors of this chapter. And this, the trending theme here I've noticed with these chapters and these presentations is the Fish and Wildlife Service employees keep drawing the short straw and we keep giving our chapter presentations. <laughs> so you have to listen to another Fish and Wildlife Service employee. So um, the underlying theme of this chapter is also the same as the vision statement for the National Seed Strategy, which is the right seed in the right place in the right time. And so you're going to hear me say this a lot in this presentation. You're probably going to get sick of hearing it, so I apologize. But it's going to get drilled into your head, I think, by the end of this. And so to start off, I'm going to paraphrase, uh, paraphrase Ron Burgundy. Native plants are kind of a big deal. Um, they are the foundations of resilient and resistant ecosystems. They serve as primary producers and soil stabilizers as well as food cover and structure for other species. So whenever we're talking about enhancing or restoring or rehabbing wildlife habitat, we're talking about plants. Plants are pretty amazing. They've survived mass extinctions and ice ages and are on every continent and nearly every type of environment. If our web of native plants collapse, the implications for pollinators, wildlife, and humans would be unthinkable. And if you think about all the talks we've heard today, their talks were not native plants or plants, but everything they were talking about was really plants. We monitor plants on the range. Invasive plants are our threat. If we heard Michelle's talk, what is burning? Plants. So you guys are seeing a theme here, right? Plants are really, like I said, kind of a big deal. And so just to introduce you to the seed strategy, this is a coordinated approach with, again, the mantra of the right seed in the right place at the right time. This was announced in August of 2015. It was developed by the Plant Conservation Alliance, which is a super awesome group of plant nerds. Um, it's made up of 12 federal agencies and over 300 non-federal organizations across the United States. We're the only country in the world with a, na with a national seed strategy. And other countries are actually looking to us um, as an example of what a seed strategy could look like in their country. And many people ask, well, why do we need a strategy? Haven't we work, been working on native plants all along? And while this is true, this strategy really brings us all on the same page, um, and we're all working together. It provides a common set of goals and actions to help us move forward. And if you listen to the theme of all the talks this morning, there is an urgent need to step up this work because of the increasing need for seed for our rangelands. And so, when you're thinking about putting seed on the ground, the first thing you think about shouldn't be what type of seed should I use. Your first thought should, should go to, do I even need to seed? And so, for instance, high elevation areas, if you guys remember all the red, yellow, and blue figures and graphs you've been seeing all morning, these areas have higher resistance and resilience. It may not need, need to be seeded in the higher R&R &R sites. Along with site R&R, &R, assessments of current conditions and past management should be used to help you decide if you need to seed. If you choose to seed an area, area, there are many different choices on the types of seed you may make. And so I'm going to walk you through this in the rest of my presentation. And so you're not going to see in my presentations the maps that you've seen in all the other presentations. Um, there's nothing red, yellow, and blue in my presentation. Um, in our chapter, we created this matrix, which I'm not even going to show you because it's too complicated and it's too little of text for you to see on the screen. And we've seen matri matrices all morning. And so I'm just going to walk you through everything that is in this matrix and give you really the backstory of the foundation of our chapter. And so the first type of seed you may choose to put on a site is locally sourced seed. And so this is seed that is from an area geographically near a planting site that is environmentally adapted and likely to establish. So in this example, 
Wyoming Big Sage Rush Seed from 13 different locations across the West, all the way from Wyoming to Arizona, were planted in Glens Ferry, Idaho in 1987. And for the first five years of the study, the survivorship was high. But by year 10, some of the non-local sources began dying off. This common garden was resampled 23 years after it was seeded. And only the local seed source from Glens Ferry, circled there in red for you, survived. All other seed sources were 50% or below 50% survival. And while this is one study that indicates that local is better, and for our long-lived species like sagebrush, we may not see the effects for decades, there is an undertaking um, here in the Great Basin to look at local adaptation and do a giant lit review. And I'm looking for Owen in the crowd, but I don't see him. But if you came to um, the seed section, or some of the seed talks yesterday, Owen and others, um, presented on this giant lit review that they're doing about local adaptation in the Great Basin. And so I'm going to give you the punchline of that 20-minute talk and that paper that is soon to be out. But patterns of local adaptation are common in the Great Basin, with variation correlated to the environment of origin. Another type of seed that you might use is seed source identified by seed zone. And so a seed zone is a mapped area with fixed boundaries in which seeds or plant materials can be transferred for the best chance of success. And so I want a show of hands. You are going to participate because it is almost lunchtime and are not going to fall asleep. How many of you are gardeners and look at seed packets to put seeds into your garden? Yeah, thank you. I knew there was gardeners in here. So on that back of that seed packet, there's a, there's a map, right? And it's this like colorful banded map of the United States and it's telling you about zones where you could put your seed. And uh, looking at that, that map on the back of your seed packet, it's telling you, you know, maybe your zone 8B and it's saying, don't put anything outside of 8B into your zone. That's, what, you know, don't put seeds from Florida in Nevada and expect it to grow. And so really, when we're talking about seed zones, it's just a more refined way of thinking of that. And so those plant hardiness zones that we're all familiar with are based on average annual winter minimum temperature. Our provisional seed zones, which is this top, um, this top map up here, this is based on minimum winter temperature and aridity. And so if you look at this map, um, the eastern U.S., these bands of color look pretty similar to what you expect on your, the back of your seed um, packet. But when you get out here to the west, it starts to become this colorful soup of, of differences. And here in the Great Basin, we have 20 different provisional seed zones. But you can take provisional seed zones one step further. And this is called an empirical seed zone. So empirical seed zones are species-specific. And they um, look at things like species morphology, phenology, and other physiologic traits coupled with all that climate information in a provisional seed zone. And so this is an example, this bottom figure is an example of um, the empirical seed zone for Poa secunda or big bluegrass, or Sandberg's bluegrass. I speak Latin, not a uh, common name. Um, and if you look at this, so that what this map is telling you is this like orange color here. So if you collected seeds here, you could, based on this genetic and climate information, you could transfer these seeds somewhere else that is different from where its original collection location is that is also that same color. So same concept as your USDA plant hardiness zone on the back of your seed packet. The next type of seed you might use is a native cultivated commercial variety. And so this is, something that has been produced in cultivation by population level selection or selective breeding. So each dot on this, this figure represents a source population used to create a cultivar or named release used widely for restoration in the Great Basin. I live and work in Nevada. Does anyone notice anything about the placements of dots on these maps in relationship to Nevada? Right, there's just one. So there's only one dot, and that represents Toe Jam Creek squirrel tail that is from Nevada, and it is not widely used. The rest of these dots are sourced from areas that are much wetter than Nevada, and some aren't even in the Great Basin, yet we continue to plant them here in the Great Basin. And so I want to give you a little more information on this. So this is a figure from a paper that explored what traits were prioritized in the development or selection in plant releases 
um, or uh, brochures or other publications for 90 cultivars and name releases of 33 species that um, of native grasses, forbs, and shrubs used in, native to the Great Basin are used here uh, and seeded. As you can see, forage yield and quality were the highest selected traits, while things like drought tolerance and genetic diversity are lower on this list. Some traits that we know have ecological value for plant species, like early green up, early flowering, early germination, and early root growth, aren't even traits prioritized in this figure. The last type of seed that you might use is non-native seed. So non-native species are alien, foreign, non-indigenous, or exotic plant species that have been introduced by humans to a location outside of its native or natural range. And here in the Great Basin, there's two types of non-natives that are often used in rehabilitation or restoration. And so you have your non-persistent non-natives. Um, these are things like sterile wheatgrass that are used as a nurse crop or soil stabilizer to preclude the migration of invasive species typically. Or you have persistent species like crested wheatgrass that exist over prolonged periods of time on the landscape. This is a study that looked at the relative cover of seeded species at sites in Tinctic Valley, Utah, recorded three years in 2002 and 16 years in 2015 following wildfire and seeding. So I don't think you can read this in the back. So the, this right here is all the different types of species that were used in these seed mixes. And there's four different seed uh, mixes used. There was um, an ARS and a BLM seed mix here on the left that was a combination of native and non-native species. And then seed mixes here on the right that were um, combinations of all natives, but an, one was a high diverse mix of natives and one was a low diverse mix of natives. And I really want to draw your attention to the ARS and BLM mixes, especially these black bars, which represent crested wheatgrass. And as you can see from these figures, these mixes were highly dominated by these species and they persist, persisted into the future. And I'm not gonna go into any more detail on this because there's an entire talk on this particular study that's gonna happen today at 1.40 downstairs in the Nugget Ballroom too. So I encourage all of you to go downstairs and listen to it to get the full story story from Jeff Ott. All right. So now that you know all the different types of seed that can be used, there are choices and trade-offs that are made when you make your seeding decisions. And so I like to think of it as asking, my, asking yourself um, a, a group of questions. And these are the questions that are in that matrix that I did not show you. Um, so first, will seeds establish? Will established plants reproduce? So non-natives and those cultivated varieties will establish. Um, and usually quickly, because they are, this is typically something they have been bred to do. Local or native seed may need one or more growing seasons to germinate and establish due to seed dormancy or other physiologic mechanisms, which we've heard uh, is a common theme throughout many other talks um, here and at this conference so far. Can seed be procure, procured quickly? Anticipating and planning for your native species um, that you want in a seed mix that needs, that's an important aspect of project management. The use of cultivars and non-natives saves time and money, allowing a project to move forward quickly because they are available on the commercial market. Could there be negative effects to the adjacent plant community? Local seed or seed source identified seed to those seed zones may, um, are the most genetically similar to the existing native plant communities and have the lowest potential for adverse genetic impacts. Some non-natives have the potential to invade and spread beyond a project boundary. Cultivars may impact population genetics through hybridization, potentially affecting overall species fitness. And if you remember that map with all the dots that I showed you, if you're moving a source from, of um, Great Basin wild rye from Canada to the Great Basin, how do you think that's gonna interact with the local population? Will follow-up management be needed to meet sage grouse or other species habitat objectives? The use of non-natives represents a trade-off for achieving diverse ecosystem and habitat management objectives. Some non-natives can be highly competitive with natives and hinder their establishment. Our, natives, um, our native forbs are a major component of sage grouse chick diets. Restoring and repairing flowering phenology through a targeted seed mix will likely result in cascading response where other native species, both plant and animals, increase. 
And so ultimately, it all comes down to what is your goal. So this is a word map I created that is a summary of all the things we tried to capture in the seed chapter of the Science Framework Part 2. We know and recognize there are many things that go into seeding decisions. In fact, this figure doesn't even capture them all. Because technology, seed storage, research, these consider considerations aren't even represented. Mostly because you have a limited number of words you can put in a word map when you use the free online tool. Uh, <laughs> And I know that probably everyone in the room can appreciate that natives are a better choice for restoring ecosystem function and diversity and provide benefits to wildlife, both wild and domestic. But the reality is that seeding decisions, especially in the context of post-fire rehabilitation, are made at a rapid pace. There, there's a reason that cost and availability are the biggest words in this figure. The National Seed Strategy represents a long-term commitment to the health of our native ecosystems. In the Great Basin, my co-authors and I, along with many other partners, some of who are in this room, are part of the Great Basin Native Plant Project. And together, we are committing that we are in this for the long haul because working together, we know we can achieve much more. There's a lot more to do to ensure the increased availability of the right seed in the right place at the right time. And in closing, I wanted to share this picture I took in Nevada a couple years ago. And I think it's a beautiful example of a healthy, di diverse, low sagebrush ecosystem in the Great Basin because it's dominated by all of our, our functional groups and it's full of beautiful forbs. And I put my contact info up as well as my co-authors and the website link to the Great Basin Native Plant Project if any of you have any additional questions. I'm getting told I have time for questions right now, too. So the question was about California having a requirement for native species and what the impacts are to the economics of that. Well, I'm not an economist, but we do fortunately have an economist working with us to help answer some of those, those sides of the questions. And Ed, I saw you nodding your head. Is there a requirement in California for that? Right, and I, I think getting to the bigger part of the question is like, yes, the local seed is going to cost more, but that long-term impact on the ecosystem, that, that diversity that it's going to provide, those ecosystem services in the long run, you know, that front cost might be more, but the long-term impact, you know, you might ha not have to go in and redo any, do anything after that. 